It's uh, always such a relief when the presentation just works <laughs> right out the gate. Okay, I am Nora Tessem. Uh, I work as a consultant um, for a company that is called Embrick RS. I'm also uh, actually lended out to the same company uh, working on software that uh, gathers all the information from all of your electronic uh, uh, meters that counts whatever power you have used. So it's in. Uh, it's usually most all of the applications are in the distribution grid domain, which is the last part of the power grid. Uh, I'm a consultant, so of course I'm a full stack developer. <laughs> That's just a given. Uh, <laughs> but my academic background is in UX databases and the formal logic. And before that, I studied art uh, philosophy. So I really like uh, abstracting things into concrete um, definitions, I would say. Um, working in, uh, in IT and having a little bit more of a background in databases than the average developer, uh, from my vantage point, uh, was like uh, having colleagues where you propose that you go down to the bus to the musty old basement and you just fight the boogeyman <laughs> in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And uh, that's what, usually how they look at you when you suggest uh, solving stuff in the database rather than in Java or JavaScript. Um, it seems like you're supposed to just run down there grab some stuff, avoid the boogeyman, and you can safely look at all of the stuff in your living room or your garden. And that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because if I want to count all my shoes or just get the shoes out of the basement, I would just get the shoes. I would stay there a little bit longer and just get the shoes. But uh, no, that's not the way you do it. Unfortunately, this is often what the basement looks like. <laughs> and I'm using the basement as an analogy for the database. Usually, a lot of companies, they just, they just, the data is so great, we just hoard it. <laughs> and then, it's not performant, I don't know, understand why. Uh, this is how you would like your databases to look, but no, this is often the case. <laughs> So you go down there and you try to find the wrench, but it's not that easy. And uh, this is the case for a lot of databases. They have a lot of tools, but somehow you need another Kafka. You always need another tool in the layer higher up, even though the tool is already built into the database. So do we all need to be database experts? No, we don't. We just need a map. We just need to know what is out there and how to find it so that when you need it, you can use it. Some of you will maybe, like me, experience that one of your colleagues have a bright idea of putting a graph database into your project. <laughs> Or maybe that was like the case five years ago when, they, the, when graph databases was, were really popular. And it's a great tool for especially non-programmers to uh, investigate insider trading when, the, when the, maybe the husband of the <laughs> prime minister has been a little naughty on the side uh, or the Panama Papers. Uh, it's super good when you have a limited data set, you want to do some stuff for that, for, on that data set, and you, want to, and you want that to maybe not last so long. You want to use it as a tool. It's a great tool, but it's not maybe something you want to implement or maintain or run on the daily. If you already have a relational database, it's pretty expensive to start up this project where you change your data, you take the, you take the pile of garbage, make it a li little nicer just to put it into like a tool you will use for a couple of months. 
you would rather maybe in invest your time into ship shaping up the database you already have and figure out actually how do you write like if if you really need recursive um relations and figure out who is related to who and your data is structured in this way and that is actually a huge part of your domain you maybe want to know how you do that in the database you already have and learn and then invest your time in learning rather than just wrangling data and putting it somewhere else it doesn't really seem very productive to me but you know the heart wants want the, what the heart wants and often that's a graph database <laughs> Uh, so nothing but a demo, no bust a myth like a working demo. Uh, if your coworker says that you need a graph database, maybe after this pr presentation you will at least know that it's possible to write loops in SQL. So um, the basis for uh, databases is set theory. And uh, I have a theory as well, uh, and that is that even though SQL is closer to natural language than a lot of the other languages that we program in, and set theory is so uh, intuitive that most children can understand it, a lot of programmers are so used to telling the computer what to do, and they're so used to using a linear, linear model of thinking that they really hate turning uh, stuff into sets and having the computer uh, solving just the technicalities of it. They want to solve. Uh, they want to solve every problem like uh, they're used to. So, what is this? Anybody? It's a Venn diagram, but also. This is known as a union. And the union slash union all, uh, it is the basis for writing recursive SQL. You have many, many sets, but all of these have the same attributes. And by using union all, you can actually join them together into one mega set. And this is very sometimes very practical if you just want to do some counts on different types of tables, and you just want to join it together into one set, you just do like this, and all of a sudden, you have the table name and the count together in one set. You didn't even need a join. And uh, if you are terrified of joins, such as some programmers are, for good reason, they're not always very efficient, but they're, uh, they aren't always inefficient. Um, there is the width clause. Um, the width keyword is a way to um, avoid pesky nested subselects and turn a lot of very complex nested subselects into separate little boxes that we programmers love and know. And then, uh, if people knew about the width, I would think that the SQL's reputation would be a lot better. And often this is what I do if I come across some very imperformant SQL at work. It's just to unfold all of it and put it into widths, and all of a sudden you got half a lifetime back. <laughs> and um, uh, a thing like this, I use, uh, there is a concept called partitioning. Partitioning, and partitioning you need if you have millions and billions of data, which I always have when I measure the power <laughs> in, and in your homes. <laughs> then there is one quadrant, which is four values per hour. And in a very big power company, this will amount to 10 million rows um, I, a day, actually. Uh, so you need to partition the tables, and then you have something called a default table and that's where all of the shit that doesn't have a timestamp go. <laughs> like if there's no if there is no extra table for that timestamp, it goes there. There's something wrong with your partitioning and you need to get it out of default into the right tables. 
I have a very good tool for this. It's called PG Partment, and I recommend it to all my friends and all of your coworkers. <laughs> Anyhow, I use this often when I just want to quick and dirty count if something has gone wrong. But on to with recursive. Recursive is actually a little bit misleading, or kind of. It kind of is, it kind of isn't. Recursion is like a matter of definition, but this is what the SQL council, or what do you want to call them, <laughs> wanted to call this function. It is actually uh, not it is actually not necessary to, to make this kind of SQL. It's kind of what uh, your, pro, uh, your professors like to call syntactic sugar. I always hated that, but anyhow. <laughs> uh, so to write recursive SQL, you need a width, you need a union. There's a little bit of a difference if you use union all or just union. Union will just discard anything that is a duplicate. Union all, you take all of the stuff, pretty much. Uh, and back to the circles, this is what we write to have a dynamic number of red circles in our query. Like for every union all that comes into to the query, there's another red circle that gets added to the big red circle. This is the way that we get loops. Most of SQL is C functions. Uh, so it's actually pretty performant. Caveat, a lot of libraries are now written in Python. So, but anyway. Uh, so I, I'm going to use Postgres as the examples. There are some differences in different languages, but I highly recommend the Postgres documentation because it's actually pretty good. And it's actually pretty brief. Both of, the, both of those things are great. So this is a very simple example where you count up to five. And so in any recursive query, there is the first section that forms the basis of the recursive query. So the first section, the select one as, this always gets executed. And then the second uh, step from the union will also get executed, but sometimes it's, it returns an empty set. And when this returns an empty set, the fun is over. And, <laughs> and it returns. And so the way that it is recursive is that for every union all, there's another set, there's another set, there's another set, there's another set, until there's an empty set. So it's, a, it's actually a little bit like if um, tail recursions was uh, with sets, pretty much. <laughs> so you, you, all of the time, you have access to the existing set that has been produced. And um, so that is why numbers to five is in the second query. That is accessing itself, kind of. So this is the result for each pass. And uh, what will happen here? Any takers? Well, probably inf infinite loop, if you were to think about it theoretically. Most of the time, not. Most uh, databases actually have safeguards against uh, inf infinite loop, and there is like a max iterations that your then it will just stop. So it will save you, but this is a way to limit it. And here you see we didn't put it in the we didn't put it in the width statement. We put it outside, but that's the beauty of databases. Usually, the query planner, it takes the whole thing and it looks at it and it makes it work in the best way. You don't have to tell it how to do its job. It just does it. So what do we use? It's very nice to write loops that counts, count up to five and everything, but that's not what we use SQL for, is it? No. Uh, we use this, these kind of statements to look through hierarchical data and then 
often the tree comes to mind, you know. Us programmers, we're always thinking about the trees <laughs> and uh, how to save them. <laughs> I don't know, paperless. Uh, well, there is a thing you can avoid if you use if you use the database for uh, uh, gathering the information about your data model and then wanting to do something with that information afterwards because you don't usually just query the database to get out your data structure. You often query it to get some aggregations. And then, you know, no round trip gets wasted. You get go into the database, you find all the relations, and then you have a set, and then you can actually do aggregations on them while you're there. You get to find all the shoes that are related to other shoes and then sum up their total income over here <laughs> or something. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people are scared of the database because of the round trip. But are you really, if you're spending multiple REST calls to find, uh, that's a round trip as well, if you ask me. Um, so I highly recommend the Postgres <coughs> documentation. Uh, it also explains very briefly and accurately how it deals with breadth first versus depth first. Well. It actually just does breadth first, but uh, this kind of ordering will determine how your result set looks like. So it's always important that your ordering is explicit if it makes sense to you that it is. <laughs> and also there are numerous ways to uh, make cycle detection. I've just shown you limit, but you know, you can always uh, keep, a med uh, keep a result of the path up to the object that you're looking for, meaning that if you have a great-grandmother, uh, the path will be her and all of her children and all of their children's children, which means you. So, how did I come to use recursive queries at the workplace? I never thought I would get the opportunity to do that, even though I have worked on other projects that had graph databases and didn't need them. Well, first of all, there's a limitation on how, when you uh, run an AWS Lambda, which means that I didn't actually need to account for the infinite loop because, you know, the company can pay for all of the 15 minutes that, that I want. and. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm pretty guaranteed there weren't any cycles because I actually trust my colleagues <laughs> like this. The distribution grid is a tree, which is why we have a graph <laughs> database. And no, that is not uh, correctly formulated, so it wasn't much use to me. Uh, the use case is that you select top-level nodes, around 5,000, a subset of them, and you run some aggregations on them, you have some waveforms, you multiply the waveforms, you get a result, blah, blah, blah. It's not the interesting math, who cares? But anyway, these are a lot and lot of key value pairs in a very inefficient data format. And I didn't want to fuck around with that. I was just like, okay, this is the way you wanted to do it. Okay, that's fine. And the graph database was accessible, but, you know, I had to do three calls to it to get each layer of the <laughs> model, which was completely useless, and it ended up uh, using a lot of resources. So this is pretty much the distribution grid. You see there, there are some, there's some infrastructure here that's boring. And then you come down, and all of these colored boxes, they symbolize consumers customers. But that is not the case. This is more like the case. There are many, 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 many consumers per circuit. And then, you know, we can group them together because we did work on that. We made some clustering stuff and uh, then there are actually just 125 different clustering groups <laughs> rather than, <laughs> you know, 200,000. <000. laughs> <laughs> and then in this case, uh, we would make a time series 
of three years, for instance, where there's many, 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 many objects as there is hours. And uh, this would be like five time series and not 25, which is a huge uh, cut. And then when I, I actually, I uh, timed the solution that was there before I did the refactoring. And I ended up on average saving 30% in execu execution time. <laughs> this is the query. Or at least the start of it. I've edited out some parts that weren't uh, interesting, but at least you see there's the distribution point. And this is actually uh, the data structure that also holds the statistics. So I didn't have to think about so many tables when doing this. And uh, all, uh, all existing uh, distribution points has a parent distribution point. And uh, the top one is the one that you get from the query or from the Java code. And then it just keeps on going until, until there is no point that is, um, that is apparent, pretty much. So then you get to the household at the end. And then you have a complete set of the entire structure from the, the top level node that you selected. And uh, this uh, comma is also syntactic sugar for a cross-join, which means that there's a Cartesian project product of both tables, both the one in the width statement, so all of the results you currently have, and then uh, the ones from the table that you are trying to join into that. And this will be very efficient. It's, in the end, it's just an inner join. You can write it uh, with an inner join if you like to be explicit, but it's not necessary. And this is usually the way you write it. Uh, so here you get it with the visualization. So it's a little bit maybe not so much easier to understand. Uh, and this is the whole thing. This pretty much gets all of the, the descendants, and then it joins it together with the distribution point statistics, with, which, is the, which is a statistics object that holds a lot of the statistics. So you see, that's a JSON object because there's a, some arrows there, and those are actually JSON operators in SQL. This is not the best way to store data that you want like really efficiently to be accessed, but if you want to change that over time and not have a very uh, static data model, it's great. And uh, yeah, there are, after the household consumer part, there's a lot of different stuff that checks if it has three of this, and that's uh, nothing you need to worry about. It's not so relevant for this, uh, this presentation. But at the end, there's a group by. And this determines that all that are in the same cluster profile, which is what we call the way that people use electricity, <laughs> they get lumped together, uh, so they are treated as one, and we scale this with the annual co consumption, which we get in the sum there. So you have the cluster profile, the number of descendants, and the annual consumption. I don't think we actually used the number of descendants, but I wanted it there just in case somebody needed it one day. Anyhow, um, some resources on SQL. Uh, I love modernsql.com. It's super great. I highly recommend a lot of his uh, uh, presentations. They have a lot about the keywords that have uh, emerged after SQL 92. SQL 92 is the standard SQL that is taught in universities, but there has happened a lot in the SQL standard since there, and especially the SQL uh, standard from 2016 is great. It has window functions. There are so many statistical functions that you can use, so you don't have to create many, many objects just to do some, some statistics. Uh, I highly recommend the manual. And also, if you are curious, you don't, and your project is not that big, maybe you don't need Elasticsearch. Maybe you just need full text search in Postgres. 
Um, there's a huge problem in our industry that the code bases are just exploding. And uh, who of you have a database? Everyone. <laughs> Everyone has a database and it has tools. Just use them. All right, that's me. Thank you.